Well, welcome everyone and thanks to Ars Electronica for the opportunity to contribute this discussion and I'd like to thank you, the artists, Catherine Melançon, Moritz Wellman and George Falk for taking the time to discuss their work, which is part of the exhibition Emergence and Convergence, currently on view at Phi Centre in Montreal. My name is Cheryl Sim and I'm the curator and managing director of the Centre's sister organization, the Phi Foundation for Contemporary Art. And I had the pleasure and privilege of being part of the curatorial team behind this exhibition. So hello to you, all three of you. Hi. I'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that Phi Center is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And I'd like to thank um, Wahea San Xian Whitebean for the writing of this acknowledgement. So the way that the panel is going to work is that we're gonna start with a question that I've prepared for each of you um, on your respective works. And then we're gonna open up the conversation between us all uh, with one or two questions that we can all respond to and discuss. But just before um, we start, I thought I'd provide context for the conversation and share a very abbreviated uh, version of the thematic concept that informs the exhibition. Is that cool? Okay, so emergence and convergence brings together works that contemplate the intersections of the self, the natural world and technology. As our experience with confinement has forced us to reevaluate our priorities and values as a global community, this exhibition puts the emphasis on how this knowledge contributes to an evolved state of awareness of the world we live in. That's the basic premise of the exhibition that brings your works together, along with the works of Daniel Corbet, Sabrina Raté, Oliver Eliasson, and Armando Kerwin and Azuma, Azuma Makoto. So mm -hmm. let's start with you, Catherine. Um, I've had the privilege of following your work for a few years now, and the questions it explores immediately sprang to mind for the thematic of this show. Um, we present several works from your series, Etat de Matière, or The State of Matter, or Material, since there's a nuance in the word matière. And these works include large-scale prints um, and video works that interpret local flora through a series of digital processes that alter their, their representation. Um, and the uncanny effect is that even in the prints, these still life works appear to be in a constant state of mutability and evolution. Can you talk about the imperatives behind this particular body of work about your, the questions which led you to engage with these materials, tools, and processes? In particular, your abandonment of control um, in this process. Certainly the pandemic has forced us uh, certainly to surrender controls in many ways. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I visited Ars Electronica uh, once and, you know, it's, it's such a wonderful experience. So it's nice to take part in this uh, virtual way. Um, thanks for your question. So <clears throat> I think the questions that first led me to this kind of work are not the questions that are keeping me, me interested in making this work evolve. Um, but when I first started, that was around 2000, actually, exploring this body of work, I was literally interested in exploring this very basic home tool that we all have around, which is the scanner, the flatbed scanner. And I, I think I wasn't aware of it, but I was sort of interested in this idea of bridging the gap, the gap between nature and culture. So really bringing um, nature uh, straight to the scanner. So having nature meeting face to face with technology. 
can you still hear me? Because it's, it's frozen on my side. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so um, the, the idea was to stop uh, using technology as something that's really uh, precious and uh, delicate and we need to be careful with it. So I was laying down tomatoes and fish and meat. So I really wanted to confront like the, the two opposite together. But I think now there days we're beyond that. We're beyond this dichotomy and we're really starting to think about uh, our relationship to all living things, uh, such as flora and, and uh, animals. Um, so I think that my uh, work nowadays is more interested in flattening the hierarchy between all living beings to kind of rethink the way we live and we organize ourselves. Um, but to come back to the work that I'm, um, I'm showing, um, I think also the, the idea of using the, the scanner uh, was to also uh, pervert its usage. So when you, you start using a scanner, the app will tell you like, oh, don't forget, close the, 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 the top. And that's, you know, I'm not doing that. The scanner doesn't like it. So it, it shows all this, these glitch in the image because I'm using it in a way that is not supposed to. And I think that's part of art history as well, like using the tools and the materials around us in, in just a different way and, and just being creative with what, are, what is around us. So I am interested in more sophisticated uh, technologies, but I'm also interested in these very uh, approachable what's around us technologies. Uh, and I think we'll maybe talk about this later, but this is a challenge in technologies. There's such a range and there's, some of them are accessible, obsolete. Some of them are, are not or are, are so sophisticated that it's, it's kind of a challenge to, to keep up. Uh, so that's what I like with the scanner. That's, it's very simple. It's, it's, it's also um, a sort of a performance because I, I move when I scan the, the objects. So that's why there's this kind of lack of information at some point in, in the image. But I like this moment of performance with the tool where this, there's a kind of dance and that's when the image is created. That's uh, actually the moment where the work is created for me. It's this, this uh, dance with the light that's passing through the, the, the scanner. Um, so to, to speak of control, um, I think um, that's the magic of it is like you, you don't necessarily control everything. Uh, well, at least with this method, because I, I don't know with all <laughs> digital tools, but this, because I'm not using it in the way you're supposed to, uh, the scanner reacts. So he's actually active in, in the making of the work. Um, so I'm allowing the tool to, to imprint the material that is created from our kind of co-creative process. And I like that because it keeps it like surprising because every time we do something together, I don't exactly know what's going to come out of it. So it keeps it um, always surprising and, and, and interesting. And yeah, I think control is, is, uh, is a bit of an illusion actually. <laughs> and I think the virus is, is reminding us of that. Uh, I think as human, we're a bit, like an anxious being and we're, we're trying to control to may, maybe manage this this kind of anxiety that is within within us but i think that um i think letting go of that anxiety and maybe seeing what happens when we let go of control can be very interesting and actually very um, transformative i uh, i couldn't agree more <laughs> I, and I really like, you know, sort of this idea of uh, addressing hierarchies and a uh, kind of post-human approach to address, you know, sort of the um, uh, age-old centrality, you know, of, of the human within the environment. Um, 
I didn't know about the the dance. Uh, it's a whole other area, I think, that maybe you want to <laughs> you want to explore. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, absolutely. You know, sort of letting go of what uh, and, and sort of letting go of anxiety about what we don't know um, is 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 part of a kind of um, uh, active practice, right? To to um, to release oneself or to be free um, to transcend, you know, as in through a meditative practice, for example, and that might, you know, tie well in with George's um, project as well. But let's pivot to you, um, Moritz. Your work, Alter Ego, is a participatory work um, that consists of a stroboscopic light and a special pane of glass. Um, the work invites two people to stand facing each other on opposite sides of the glass and the flashing light creates an effect whereby your face is cast onto the body of the person across from you and vice versa. Um, the effect is that of a simultaneous estrangement from your own body and yet a connection with the other person seems to take place. Tell us more about the philosophical questions that you're exploring that prompted you to make this work. And I'm particularly interested to know if and how confinement might have brought some of these questions into sharper view. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me to this panel and I'm glad that I can maybe talk a little bit about the work which also is a couple of years old. It's, uh, it started in 2010. And it actually didn't really start with a philosophical question, but much more with a very, very uh, uh, personal question of how communication works. And I was reading about mirror neurons at that time. It uh, was a discovery by um, Giacomo Rizzolatti in Italy. And um, it stated that if we see somebody acting or doing something that our brain kind of does the same thing in the, in the brain areas. And I was curious how to, uh, or whether there is any way to make that graspable, this effects of mirroring each other in communication. And, um, in the end, I think the work does more than just questioning this question, but raises much more other questions about the relationship of us humans uh, with each other. And um, I, I, I think the, the work somehow disrupts our everyday experience of the otherness and the selfness, which is something very new to kids. That's, I think, is the, the reason why kids are usually very happy with the installation and are never afraid. For them, it's quite normal to interact. And they also see the strange effects, but they are never frightened. While some grown ups with a very stable and fixed self image have troubles uh, seeing themselves mapped onto somebody else and vice versa. Um, so I think many of the philosophical questions also arise, uh, arise when, when you're actually in it. And it's so difficult to describe what actually happens because I think the, for me in many of my works, it's quite important to be in a real uh, setting or in the real physical space and a real scenery and I think uh, especially with the confinement at the moment it's quite interesting uh, that all this is missing or missed so much by so many people that people are uh, really um, yeah they they wish so much to actually meet in physical spaces to go just go out for dinner suddenly becomes an event yes. and uh, I, I think in terms of this, I think the installation uh, is maybe uh, or gained some more uh, importance in a, in a way or is making that more visible or graspable that this physical uh, interaction is actually something um, it, yeah, very, very important to us. And 
Um, then I also thought that, or I think that um, if you, if you um, see the confinement that happens in, in the installation itself, there's also a, a certain way of confinement because there you realize that you're kind of confined to the other or the confinement that you establish the, with your body. You know that it is usually, you know, the mirror image that's you and your body is suddenly disrupted. And this confinement between me and you doesn't work anymore in a way. So, or at least it's distorted. And yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, I, had, I was wondering about uh, how, I mean, when I experienced the work, I was with someone I knew who's actually, you know, our, our founder director. <laughs> and so that was sort of an interesting, um, you know, sort of power relationship as well that you've become aware of. But what about when people don't know each other and uh, what does that do? Uh, that's, uh, that's, quite interesting that's also because uh, uh, why I like so much being with the installation just listening to people and as I said before usually with kids it's fine they they are not uh, that much disturbed they are happy seeing other people and everything is kind of strange and um, with people who know each other very well or in general when people see each other in the installation what they often realize and what i what you would not find always very objective is that they say something like ah yeah we we look very similar and in a way of course all humans look very similar and there there are bounds between us which we are usually not that aware of and uh then it also um, depends on how open people are. There are sometimes people who just see somebody else and it's kind of an intimate experience because, uh, yeah, it's, it's your self-image and many people are so much fixed on their, their self-image. So it's kind of a disruption of the personal space as well. And they... Uh, often react uh, frightened or they start laughing. And I mean, laughing is also often a, a way of uncertainty. There's mm -hmm. definitely a huge amount of uncertainty that happens, but it's the difference of how to react to it, I think, that makes it interesting. Uh, seeing yeah. Different people. Uh, um, a final thought I, was, I had was around the duration because the, uh, the initial effect uh, and the discomfort or the laughter, which is, as you say, a kind of way of addressing a discomfort, you know, with, a, with what you're um, experiencing. Um, I feel like it's a really good idea that people stay, you know, it's like, ha, ah, okay, and then, you know, and then I'm out of there. Um, but if they stayed for like five minutes, say, like what would the range sort of of um, emotion and cognition be? And what would you experience after on the other side of that, you know, more durational time? How, I, you know, just uh, before we move on to George, how long have people been able to sustain that experience in your, you know, with, with what you've seen? Um, uh, that's, that's as different as people are. So there were some people at Ars Electronica last year, which really wanted to stay for quarter or something like that, which is rather un unusual, I would say. But like fifteen it, minutes, sorry, like fifteen minutes long. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but okay. but that was that was surprisingly long. Usually, <laughs> I mean, it's also this exhibition context. It depends whether there's people lining up and queuing. That also creates another effect on it, but. Um, I think if you really have the chance to take your time, I think it's what you say, if you really let go and start playing a little bit longer, that's, that's very, um, uh, um, how to say that, uh, it really takes you on a journey. 
I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's move on to George. Um, I've also had the privilege of seeing you evolve as an artist from uh, filmmaking and now video installation, and you created a new immersive work um, for this exhibition called Seeking Stillness. It's, it's a monolithic video projection that beams from the height of the ceiling. It goes, flows all the way down the wall and then like swishes um, a, a, along the floor of the entire space. Visitors are invited to sit or lie down on the floor where they're completely bathed in light images. And there's also an immersive sound composition. Um, as a durational work, it's like about 30 minutes. We're compelled to let go and to let it happen. I think that's something that you, that is a very uh, sort of a, a red thread that um, brings all your works together. Um, can you share the concerns that motivated you to make this work? Um, the title prompts us to consider the speed at which we've been living our lives up until now. And certainly, you know, this experience with the pandemic has forced us to slow down. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, first of all. Yeah, to go back to the, the inspiration of the project, it's like, I think around two years ago, um, I'm already, like, few years ago, I already started very interested in, like, how to research on how technology impact people and as inspiration for my work in a positive and negative way. And then I think two years ago, there's huge topic on the impact of social media, they have Cambridge Analytica, and there's a conference about time well spent, and there's an exponential discussion about what is the impact of social media on people, what connectivity do to people. And I think that from then to now, even though there's a lot of discussion, it doesn't happen slow down. As a matter of fact, it kind of actually grew even more. So it's a bit of a concern, like, how wired we are when I have this opportunity being talked about like being kind of like a confinement commission to build this work or to finish this work is always thinking about the how can uh, as an artist contribute like an alternative experience or provide something a little bit different for to create some kind of experience for people to meditate to contemplate a place for introspection to Slow, slow down the notion of time in comparison of the current now. And I asked myself why I'm interested in that. And I think it came from a lot of my interest in, um, in religious architecture, the interior, also my uh, place of worship. And when I travel, usually I like to go to visit um, churches in, the, in different countries. Uh, and I find it very intriguing. Like in, Places in Italy or in Greece, they have very elaborate churches and places in Iceland, they're very minimalistic, almost like nothing. Kind of thing that in, it's just interesting to look at these kind of places because in today's secular world, it's still very relevant. People still want to go there to sit down to experience it. And I realized something very interesting that probably the church is one of the first immersive experience that we created. Because when you go in, you're surrounded by this awesome mega space and then really like more than usual ceiling heights and then you're surrounded by all kind of decorative art and ornament and in front you have this massive altarpiece which you're supposed to focus on and and often it's very narrative the story in there and then not only that it often companion with uh, sermon or speech or prayers and then afterward, you have this massive organ, like you have sound that shower to you from the top and they fill up the whole space. So that creates some kind of um, awesomeness of, or, or, or that experience is something that I'm very captivated and see how can we brought it to, to the 21st century in the museum setting, in the gallery setting, without the burden of this huge religious, notion and and but keep the but keep that meditative and introspective side of it and bring it to the audience so that's the intention of the work um and also the other thing is that church experience is always passive you you you'll be invited to sit down to or to just be still and observe rather than uh, 
participant rather than an active experience that constantly moving. Because I see a lot of immersive work, people running around, moving their hand, trying to create a pattern. But that's not the intention of this work. This work wants you to, to really slow down, to observe it, and to be part of it as a collective experience. Um, I was reading a little bit something about um, the thinking of the brain. And, when you, and I don't know whether it's 100% true, but when, like when you go to a concert, people observe something together. Like all of a sudden, you hear a very fast song, and it's the next song, the singer come up with a, with, with a one piano or guitar, and then you sing. Everybody stop all of a sudden, quiet, observing that moment. And, and there's some kind of very interesting experience that everybody's like spring singing together, experience that. So I was attempting to using my work to see whether I can create that kind of common experience to connect people together. And it's, it's, an it's an individual experience at the same time, it's like a um, communal experience at the same time. Yeah. So, so that's basically the, the, about the inspiration, the format. But maybe talking about in terms of the, the context, because it's talking about the notion of time, right? Because um, when you have a lot of going, things going in your life, or you feel the time pass really, really fast. But then when you're in different places, like let's say you're taking a hike or you're doing a, your perception of time change. So uh, I'm interested in reading like people study about the notion of time. There's physicists like um, uh, Carlos Ruffelli talking about time is relative in different parts of the, like very minor setting outside of the, in different part of the universe, the, 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 the sense of time is different. I can't really articulate it, but the time is not a par parallel experience. And then the theologian that also talk about the notion of time very different. And then you, you read about Marcel Proust talk about the, 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 uh, the loss of time that he, he was talking about notions. So this, this actually the, the perception of time varies. So I, I think that's the intention. So, so in that, hopefully the, to play with the notion of time to induce that you're thinking that, wow, okay, uh, there's things that are more significant than ourselves. And that's stillness, the cameras you're talking about, or the absolute, or the, the constant. And in that sense, when you recognize that, that you are not that significant or you, at all in the, the grand scheme of things, actually you bring you some kind of, some kind of freedom. You know? So yeah, I hope I explained the work well. In that yeah, sense. absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think you blew my mind a little <laughs> yeah. in, in regards to the church as, uh, as like one of these original immersive experiences. And of course, like I think of um, video artists like Bill Viola, you know, when mm -hmm. I think about the sort of the transcendence, um, you know, uh, of, of uh, um, the, from the self mm -hmm. and also this kind of experience with, a, with um, um, uh, an immersive space that that brings you in touch with things that are beyond yourself, beyond sort of the ego self, if you will. And, um, and the idea of it being at, like thinking about the rock show, for example, like the concert experience. I mean, that is absolutely um, a kind of modern day, um, you know, quote unquote, religious experience where, you know, we have a great deal of people coming together to connect. And so what I've, you know, and having this conversation with all three of you, I mean, there are incredible connections left, right, and center. I mean, it's amazing to see how you um, are all sort of, in, you know, um, digging into the ideas of transcendence very, very generally through encounters, um, which allow us in many ways to detach, right, from... Um, kind of the earthly self from the fixed self from our relationship uh, on the earth with plants and animals and then with a kind of sense of a spiritual self I, I i'm like absolutely delighted you know to to um have this experience where i'm like getting all of this incredible food from you so now that we have a, a kind of a primer a little bit on each of your works i'd love to propose a couple of kind of big questions um, and open up the conversation amongst all four of us. Uh, you each question the state of the human condition and its relationship with uh, a hyper-technologized world. Um, 
and maybe in Moritz, in, in your case, also with a kind of a world that is, um, you know, sort of mediated through, through bodies and, and through sort of um, neurological uh, experiences. So how do you regard technology and its role in the creation of art? I mean, I think I have a little bit of that, but I'd love to hear us all talk to, to each other in this way. Is it a tool like any other? Um, does working with electronic or digital technolo technologies present any limitations? And I think, um, Katrin, you were very good at talking about how artists subvert the use of technologies um, to get them to uh, move and do beyond what they, are orig they were originally intended for. Uh, and are there properties within electronic or digital technologies themselves? Um, that you harness as a way to investigate your questions. And what I mean by that is conceptually, um, are, there, are you using specific uh, materials and tools because of their nature and what that does for your work? Or, I mean, and they can just be tools, you know, just a means to an end as well. Um, who would like to jump in on that? Maybe Kat Finn, you know, um, you know, we, we talked it, you talked a, a lot about the, um, you know, sort of the happenstance, you know, sort of of the uh, creative possibilities of the unknown through the use of a flatbed scanner. And, and I know you use many other um, tools, digital tools as well. So how do you feel about um, these things? Yeah. I think technology is like, it's, it's a language. It's a tool, it's a material. So it's, it's kind of everything at the same time. I think we can say the same maybe of, of more traditional art materials uh, because they all resist in some ways. They all have an agency. So this comes back to uh, what I'm, I'm interested in now is uh, how uh, things and uh, living beings act and uh, have an agency and we're not the only one having the power or, or having uh, an effect on what surrounds us. Um, so I think it's, um, technology is, is fascinating and, and, and frustrating and also very um, complex. So I think it, it, it has a, maybe a, a more um, diverse way of, of resisting <laughs> to us. Um, I think because there's coding as well, there's like, it's, 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 it's so diverse, complex and deep and it evolves as well. So I'm currently using scanners, but there's so many uh, new, you know, technologies coming out all the time, which is also very um, stimulating. Uh, but also can be a bit like frustrating. I, I remember uh, the artist Kenny Wati was talking about, you know, using Second Life and a each time there's a new version, she needs to adapt to it. And, and that's quite something. When you use a pen, the pen is a pen. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, we're not reinventing the pen every nowadays. So this is a challenge with, with technologies and, and I was also speaking of access earlier where um, I like to be able to use it um, easily uh, and with my new projects i'm using sensors and arduino and other kind of kind of technologies but then you need a team so it, it creates a, com a complexier way of, of making work and you don't always have the funding or the facilities or the access so it, it it's complex but it's also very, very interesting and, 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 you know, it's, at first I got interested in um, technologies because it was, it was new, like there was so many possibilities and there's, are still so many possibilities and it will, it's probably an endless thing. So it's, it's kind of overwhelming, but it's also very attract, attracting, attractive. So, you know, you want to explore these new tools and you want to discover what you can do with those. And then it's like they're, they're having, you, uh, having you practice progress with the new possibilities. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's very challenging and, mm -hmm. and rewarding at the same time. It's almost like limitations 
become a kind of new material to you? Or I mean, I mean, I should rephrase that. Limitations are have always been part of uh, the uh, the artistic process and and what it affects uh, um, outcomes and inspires new possibilities. But it you know is no it, and then that becomes no exception um, with uh, electronic or digital technologies or tools. Exactly. Probably speeding up actually. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Moritz? I mean, yeah. I, I'm curious to know about how you, the, maybe the research that you had to embark on to, um, you know, assemble the materials that you did for, for your work and, and I guess your general feelings about technologies as artistic tools. Yeah, I, I think my work is also maybe interesting in terms of technology because it's exactly at the edge of uh, analog and digital technology because um, I mean we don't really we are not really able to perceive anything digital digital is something that is, in the first place is strange to us and that's also why it's interesting for artists to work with because it's kind of a, this hidden hidden almost magic thing behind devices and all kind of technologies that we are using every day and um, I think it's I mean many artists are a bit like kids when they break up their electronic devices to figure out how it actually works and I think that's also kind of the importance why uh, artists should do digital technology art because uh, the the consumer market is kind of trying to close everything, to make everything slick and closed and intuitive. And the role of the artist is kind of messing with this too easy um, technology that's all around us. And yeah, I, I think in general, I, I like disturbance or mm -hmm. disturbing things or at least um, making people aware of that the normal is also a creation. And I think also what is interesting in terms of technology is that we are, I mean, technology is very old. I mean, building a house is kind yeah. of based on technology, but the digital technology is uh, so interesting because yeah, there's so many things behind a network that we can't see at the same time a network that if you learn a little bit how it works you can control in a way that you i mean you can make shapes so perfectly round that you could never do in physical space or something like that or um i think yeah there's a very interesting relationship between this new technologies and the old technologies and i think many of the artists uh, who work on this boundary are yeah exactly interested in this in this break between the physical analog and the digital magic world yeah well said i mean i'm glad that you brought up the idea of the what the consumer market you know sort of um aims to do in kind of keeping these things sort of hermetically sealed um, and that, yeah, it's, it, it's artists who are, who are always going to like bust open that box and uh, that, you know, you think of these things too as kind of magical um, and that there's an actual spirit in there is, uh, you know, sort of really interesting as well. George, thought, your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I think Catherine and Morris covered quite a bit what I have to say, but maybe I can bring a little bit. I, I love technology, but at the same time, even though I've been critical about it, and I think I won't be an artist if I don't, if these technology, these technology won't be available. It allows me to do what I do and say I want, what I wanted to say. Um, without that, it's probably very difficult to, to I mean, think about the, the last few pieces of work I do. It's related with archival footage, whatever, and even the, the process of researching, like researching, going through, looking for archival footage or historical footage to, or doing research. Right now, because 
of this connectivity because of YouTube, because of uh, archive, because of all kinds of things. You can see range of historical things and the amount of knowledge and material that you can access is so massive. So I think it's a positive thing. And without that, I don't know how I'm gonna able to do the work I'm gonna do. And I like to talk about this current piece of work. I was just learning new software. At the same time, like I was picking up learning, trying to do 3D software and I realized, okay, the frustration came is it's the learning curve is really, really deep. So as an artist, if you're doing technology, technology is you constantly have to learn and upgrade yourself. And the amount of time to invest is quite a bit before you get to do what you have to do, before you're able to be comfortable using it to do what you have to do. But at the same time, it opens such a wild flexibility and, and it forces you to learn different things. Like, like when doing this piece, you have to learn 3D and within 3D software, it's not just a visual experience. You understand 3D space, you understand how uh, coding and software work to synthesize texture. And some part of it involves mathematics to, to create the libraries and that kind of thing. So I have to go back to understand, okay, how this uh, advanced math use a tangent cosine, how this thing work and have to go back to understand the calculation of that. So, so sometimes it could be quite frustrating, but at the same time, you know, uh, I don't want to fight against it. I wanted to use to the advantage of that. I know there's dangers of that. I know that the dangers is like, is one of, one of the dangers of it is, or, or, or the downside of it is, it quite obvious, especially in the digital world, is it creates similar work because people are using similar tools, similar software, similar plugin. And right. often you see, especially in digital art, there's a lot of similarities. So it's quite important to not to be fetishized by the two rather than focus on what you have to say. And, and that's a challenge. I think a lot of digital work is, yeah. And it's easy to be copied. It's like, wow, this is cool, this is hip. And then lots of people will look for what software, what to, to do it. And then it's very easy to be duplicate. And then, so the, that's the thing. So, so it go back to the thing that rather than the two, it's important that what you want to say with these two is you no, know, with this, um, this medium, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, that, that's, um, you know, sort of as a curator and, and also as, a, as an artist myself, I find that, uh, you know, one must always question oneself about, um, you know, uh, what is the best way to say that you want what you want to say? Um, what is the best um, medium through which to convey those questions? And so really what it comes down to is what is my question? Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, the tools and um, media sort of issue from those um, answers and the answers may never come. It's just part of this ongoing investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it leads me to my next question, which is more about the relationship um, uh, with technology and, you know, sort of, um, I guess the, the human, um, and maybe we can extend that out so that we are conscious of, you know, the, the, Ever in, never ending desire to put human at the center of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and this question is like perennial. Uh, we're not going to answer it. I think it's something we have to ask ourselves all the time. And I'm going to um, contextualize the question with uh, this, um, this series of lectures by Ursula Franklin. She's this physicist, um, and in 1989, she gave a series of lectures called The Real World of Technology. Um, they were these massy lectures that were broadcast on the CBC here in Canada. And in the lecture, she questions how technologies, you know, have permeated our everyday lives. And she, she claims that over time, we have become increasingly blind to the hegemonic quality of these systems. Um, I, I would say, sort of in a general sense, perhaps not you three, <laughs> which have led uh, to us becoming increasingly blind um, to, and that perhaps technologies have contributed to a, a possible deterioration of human relationships, the quality of life um, and the natural environment. What do you think of this? What major impacts have um, technologies, be they electronic, digital, um, how, what have they had on this, this human psyche? And I'm curious to know if you think 
they that they have disciplined us and how um, with the um, understanding that technologies do uh, delineate and and um, uh, I guess articulate how to do things, how not to do things, what's the right way to do things, and um, if we're doing it or not doing it, is that a form of discipline? You know that the technologies impose on you know the human psyche and the body. I throw it out to you. <laughs> it's my gift to it's you. My <laughs> really light question. <laughs> you know. I think yeah. It's as you said. I think we we can't fully uh, answer that, but I think it's like I have a hate and love relationship to it because. The, for instance, we just um, keep um, take um, like the access to uh, searching online about things that interests us, uh, this access to information, to sharing, to discussing with uh, strangers, connecting to uh, people. Um, my mother is on Facebook. She has more friends than me. And she speaks about spirituality with people around the world. I mean, this is amazing. She's like in North Quebec in a little, you know, house in the countryside and she's connecting with the world. It's amazing. Like, she, mm -hmm. and, and I think, um, you know, like we, the, the, um, the interactivity, what it brings to artworks as well, that being able to be involved in the artwork to find meaning through gestures and actions and, and being part of the work, I think it's, it, it adds so much to, to uh, the possibilities of, of, of um, discussing and, and exchanging. So, yeah, it's, it's and, and we know, we all know what, you know, the, 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 the dark side of technologies are. It's, it's sort of like a very polarized um, a, a topic, I think. And, and yeah, we just need to, I think, become better humans so we make a better use of it. <laughs> I think the human is always a problem behind a problem. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, well, it's, I feel like you have a research creation practice, you know, which is kind of, you know, in, um, concerned about uh, how we how we actually interact with each other. I mean, this personal question around communication seems to be like a direct kind of uh, response to or way of addressing the impacts of uh, our dig you know a kind of high hyper technologized world and how we actually deal with each other. <laughs> mm. Yeah, the, the question also brought uh, another work of mine into my mind, which. Actually, it was a like a, um, a stitched image of a landscape in a region where you have very nice echoes and you could shout into the image and there was a microphone and then there was just the audio connection between the image that sh was showing the countryside and uh, the actual space and there was a live audio connection, which is nothing else than um, what we are doing here right now and uh, people were doing in the 50s with their telephones mm -hmm. and at the same time once you bring this very every very simple everyday technology into a new context it suddenly makes you realize what actually um, this technology does for us that there is some kind of magical things like you said Catherine your mother's talking with people all around the world I mean that is that sentence a couple of decades ago would have meant that she's mental or something like that but now everybody knows that uh, uh, that it's actually possible and we kind of adapt to this magical world in a way that we are start uh, taking it as a usual, like a real everyday world. And I think that is also interesting in terms of this virus again, mm -hmm. um, uh, that we realize that there's still this gap or difference between a te technologized conversation or something like that uh, and the actual physical conversation. And I think what I feel not very comfortable with often is that 
technology is sold as something that could replace reality, but it's always, always just good when it's adding something to reality. And I think that's a mistake people often do, like mm -hmm. uh, seeing it as a alternative, but I think it's just a addition to, to our world and yeah. George, the last, uh, last words from you. I think the, the, the impact on the human side, we, we covered a little bit already. Like that is definitely positive side. That like as an immigrant, I can connect to my family, to Hong Kong or friends, to people, I mean, connected people together. But I mentioned before, there's instant available of, of expansion of knowledge for research and all kinds of things. We see way more things because of the connectivity. But also, I mean, to go back to talk about the, the research I did the last few years, that the, the darker side of it, right? The, the polarization of it that it could create, uh, you see in the political front, right? Uh, the, the, create, the, the enhancement, this think about all this conspiracy theory, um, also like there, there is negative side of it. And um, I think we have to be very careful how to address it. But also there's another thing, we go back to the connectivity question is, is the speed because it's so fast, the new cycle, it came in. So the time to process is very short and the time to respond is very short. So when, when people don't have that defense mechanism or understanding, so it, we kind of like fall back to that instant uh, spontaneous reaction. Constantly, is, that's why I often did that, the spontaneous reaction is very um, polarized. And that's how I think the speed has to do with a part of it. And then maybe to, to go on the second question is about the environment. That's actually very interesting because last year I did a project on about the environment of a, a inter connectivity internet and the environment because we in front of the screen, we click, we buy, or we do things, but we didn't see the server. They, they call it the cloud, but the cloud actually is not like a queue floating cloud. It's huge mega yeah. structure with machines and computers, servers and cables. And the, I think the tech, I was reading about the tech giant and all this structure. The carbon footprint is as much as the aviation in industry. Think about the, the just the transportation and then Amazon building warehouse according to the, the location of the city. So it also changed the urban structure and the delivery system and stuff like that. So, and when you buy stuff digitally online, I right, think about you click the raw material came from petroleum. You go to China, the manufacturing and the ship for the oceans with huge cargo ship that impacted in the marine animals or anything in the shipping around the world. And then, Tr trucks going around the cities, different parts, especially in North Amer American Europe. So the actually involve a lot of hardware. So it's actually quite big, the environment nature, like, like digital on, it's not just simple, I click, I buy something. So if you really think about what's behind each time you click, you buy something, actually there's a lot, a lot of hardware and, and carbon footprint involved. So the, the way to look at this is the way to, how do we reduce it, right? When we using it day to day, nobody's able to escape from it. Right now is, I mean, for the moment when we don't have the absolute answers, probably have to do a little bit less, but maybe the way it's like moving forward is how, I don't know whether the offsetting, the green offsetting thing makes sense or not. I've been pondering about it too, but we're not gonna go back to not connect, right? But moving forward, this is still an unknown question, you know, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the fact that we're able to do this conversation now, I mean, the irony is not lost on me, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, throughout, it's like, thank God we have the internet, you know, we're like completely poised in this way for those of us who have access, of course, you know, to be able to um, have still that opportunity to, to connect. Um, I, would, I would love to um, continue this conversation, and I'm sure we will in some way through space and time. Um, but uh, I just want to thank you all for, you know, sharing this um, time with us for your participation in the exhibition and for sharing your insights. Um, thanks also to my colleagues, uh, to Maria Machard and Claudia Guerra and uh, Kim Sui uh, for helping with this event. Uh, and to Asa Electronica for the invitation. And finally, 
you know, thanks um, to all you uh, for joining us today.